Coming at you again, finally! About to drop a new video. I know it's been a minute. Work makes my shit unbearable. And guess what? This ain't my primary job. So, until it gets to the point where I have, you know, the means to support myself off of just YouTube, but I have me if you want to really help me, like, share, subscribe, and talk to me in the comments can definitely help my channel grow. Until then, this is Forbidden Door 2023. Now then, I am happy. It's the time of the year where AEW meets with New Japan. And I will say this, this year is a little bit off, if not for the fact that we have Collision now basically throwing its hat into the proverbial wrestling ring as another night of professional wrestling, and it is good. I will talk about it in a separate video, but for now, that basically meant that building the show this year was a little bit of a workaround, but I feel like they've done pretty good, and at least on the day of, in the week building to, and prior to, they've managed to put together a pretty solid card. Not enough women's wrestling for my liking. Definitely would say they need more, but I will still say the card is pretty fucking good. Now, they're opening up the night, not counting the zero hour, which in and of itself was probably the best way to heat up the night. I mean, really and truly. It, this, this That hour beforehand worked better in heating up the crowd than the first match. But the first match is still a really good match, and the crowd was definitely fire for it. We have the AEW World Champion, Maxwell Jacob Freeman, going up against the ace of New Japan. Not the current ace, but the ace of all time, the legend himself, Hiroshi Tanahashi, in a pretty solid match. And that's the best way I can describe it, is solid. Tanahashi isn't a spring chicken like he used to be. He's... Obviously, showing his age, a little bit of wear and tear. His moves aren't high and high impactful like they were maybe some four or five-ish years ago. And even then, nowhere near what he was doing around the time whenever he had his legendary feud with Kazuchika Okada. But at the end of the day, this made it. This meant that working with Max was a lot easier because it could be a lot slower. Because Max is a more traditional, old-school type of wrestler. He's more cerebral in how he in how he operates. He doesn't do the pomp and circumstance, the high fly, flippy dippy, or the excessive shows of power. I mean, he can. That's why he's better than you, and you should know that. But still, I will say, these two together, it was a pretty damn good match. I'm going to go with a B plus because there's nothing that was particularly stand out about it for me. And again, this not being a New Japan Strong Style match, a Western traditional match, it was all right. Tanahashi did get to shine, and I'm glad that he did. But I am perfectly content with what I received. So, once again, B plus and a damn good opener. But, if you wanted something a bit more impactful, if you really wanted what could feel like a strong style type match, they definitely answered that with match number two. Um, the first men's match in the Owen Hart um, tournament this year. Again, something else I'm so glad they're bringing back. Not to mention kicking it off in... Canada for tonight, uh, we have uh, Kojima going up against CM Punk. CM Punk tonight coming out as the hill punk we've been wanting and expecting for some time now was not playing. These guys really were going at it solid, striking, um, hot, off, like on there with the attitude, punk taunting the crowd, and even when Punk came out, before his music even hit, he was being bombarded with booze, but obviously the cheers, him being so polarizing, and it's similar to a situation that John Cena found himself in where we would have half of the crowd booing and half of the crowd cheering. Depending on your location, we'll decide which one again. You're in Chicago, CM Punk is beloved. He will be cheered, but they are in Canada. Not only, this is the home, the homeland of Kenny Omega, the op. And quite frankly, I am more shocked 
that it didn't go that far. But I do love the way this match went as far as getting the more Western fan base that might not be in tune to Japan. More for me with Kojima really bigging up his accomplishments and the fact that he was not only a not only uh, IWGP World Heavyweight Champion, but also at one point in time, uh, the, the All Japan Triple Crown Champion, which is a damn good feat. Kojima is really that dude. And him and Punk were really hitting like men that had real problems and beef. This wasn't for children. This was a goddamn Japanese style, hard hitting. You really think you bought it? You better show that you bought it. Bought a type of match, and I live for it. Not to mention Punk with his hill bullshit taking a timeout to pull out the Hogan leg drop, and them then commentary pointing out, you know, how he's really. Uh, all about his vitamins and prayers. I was fucking done and there for it. But really and truly, the match was good. Kojima with solid counter on the first uh, GTS. Uh, then setting up for the Larry, only for Punk to come around and put his ass to sleep with the GTS. I must say, of course, I knew Punk was going to win. But this match was so inner fucking tated. It definitely has risen up the crowd's energy to where. You know, they're even more ravenous than they were prior to. Not to mention, Hunk, Punk ain't slick when he was trying to leave at the end. He was starting to go down the hill door, and he was like, oh, wait, I'm going to go that one. Punk, depending on where you are, decides what kind of hill you are. Or if you will be faced. Of course, you're going to be faced in Chicago, but let's see what happens when the crowd is really, really behind you. Um, for me, this match, unequivocally, is getting an A-. minus. It's not even, it's no argument that it is in the A territory, I'm going to say minus because the, the, the work was okay. It's not that it was okay because it was great, but we just weren't going to expect a lot. We got two veterans that are bringing, two guys that are a bit older there. For me, Punk is still able to go the way he needs to, but with Kojima's style, I feel it's it, his years are really weighing on him. But, hey, hey, that's just my honest opinion. Um, But, yeah, A minus for me in this match because just a minus. Um, also, part after the match, we do get a confirmation that we will be having all out in Chicago. Now then, I am happy. Also, that's going to be a crazy fucking week because guess what? If you don't remember, we're going to have all in Wembley, the return of the OG, the founding show that led to the creation of all elite wrestling, all in. Then following all in, we're going to have the build-up week to All Out. Now then, this should most definitely come off as a extravaganza, as a wrestling week in the same vein of All In, where that week it was like so much stuff happening, so many events happening, pressers and whatnot. That's what should happen with something this monumental. This is a crazy year, and this is a crazy summer of wrestling, especially for AEW. I look forward to to the, uh, closing out the summer with a bang, with All Out, and hopefully, maybe, we can work around to getting that uh, Elite versus CMSTR match. Just just would be nice, in my humble opinion. Now, following that dope-ass CM Punk action, we have the Fatal 4-Way for the AEW International Championship. I am talking about Orange Cassidy, Shibata, we have Zack Sabre Jr., and Daniel Garcia. The fun funny thing being is that Three out of these four individuals are current champions, which about to be in the ring of honor, pure champion. Zack Sabre Jr. being an IWGP inter, no, IWGP uh, world TV champion. And of course, Cassidy himself being the AEW international champion, leaving the odd man out in this match, Garcia. But with that being said, Garcia had a lot to prove and definitely showed his shit, which he's been doing. He's been having stellar fucking matches. And honestly, there could be more with this feud with Cassidy if it was really more one-on-one -on -one and being built into a big one-on-one -on -one match. Ca um, but there's also Shibata, who Daniel Garcia has been feuding with for the pure title, and maybe we can get some, ZS some uh, ZSJ action up in there. But outside of that, amazing work all, uh, all around. I mean, Cassidy just a fucking charisma magnet. Shibata giving stellar hits as well as great technical wrestling. Uh, Cassidy, too, but honestly, who's going to be, who's going to out-tech How's it going out tech, the top techer in Zack Sabre Jr.? Then you're like, honestly, this is this this could have been a great like round robin tournament of just technical, amazing wrestling. I don't even know why I'm so focused on it. 
but I really do love technical wrestling. Um, truth be told, the match was great. I cannot find much fault with it except for the ending because, like I said in the beginning, and how I've been feeling for some time, Orange Cassidy has held his belt for quite some time. Now, the only thing keeping him from Jay Cargo territory is the simple fact that he has far better matches. But I need a feud with time and a build into a bigger match for Cassidy. Cassidy has been putting on banger after banger, but eventually it kind of wears thin. And I'm a guy who loves just getting straight to the wrestling. But sometimes I can need a bit more. You know what I mean? Because... The burnout is showing, and yes, this is like, once again, I think it's like the second or third time Cassidy has done the maneuver of just stealing the victory from under somebody else at the last second, which is dope. But unless we're going to see a more desperate Cassidy, yeah, I can say maybe we should be looking into it. Now that he is tied with Jay Cargill for, damn near tied with Jay Cargill for title defenses. So I am curious to see if they're going to have him break it or tie with her. It could be a bit dope, but this match for on the night, <clears throat> I am going to say a solid B plus, could say A minus territory, but I guess my own biases are keeping me from just feeling like there's more because the story is there, but I would have preferred something more defined and more built up than how this came about. Okay, so this part leaves me mixed, and also I feel away. So... Jack Perry versus Sonata for the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship. I can it, will admit that the match was great. Jack Perry basically did come out pretty fucking hard. Was definitely uh, showing that he studied the champion. He was definitely being underestimated, un underrated by the champion himself. It showed that he can fucking go. And Sonata, more, for the most part, really seemed like a champ that was underestimating his prey, but did, was not falling behind. He was basically keeping himself okay in a head, just to let it be reminded, all right, young blood, I see that, you know, you can do a little something, but I'm the fucking champ. I feel a few things. One, as great as Jack Perry is, Jack Perry has not been put in a situation where he appears to be built up to this upper level. I mean, hell, Sonata won the match with a moonsault, and I don't even think that's his finish. That makes me feel away. Granted, the crowd still cheered on the match, some standing ovations, but don't you think that something feels weird about this particular match? That the IWGP World Heavyweight title isn't being shown as much reference as it should? That's not some rinky deep belt. That belt has a monster lineage behind it. And between the placement and even the challenger, I felt like this was more kind of bigging up Jungle Boy and really just building towards the end angle. By the way, if I'm a great this match, if I'm, I'm like I said, for in ring, I'm not really I don't I'm not really have anything to say about the story or build to it. It kind of the if I really take in the build to this match. I would give it a B, but the in-ring was solid as little as it was, so I'm going to go with a B plus. But just this felt lesser than for this belt. It felt lesser than for the champion. And it felt like the main key point was really this end angle. And I'm not gonna add, you know, this angle to any potential bonuses to this. Now that if they run now that if they run this back. I could definitely appreciate it. If this leads to Jungle Boy going to Japan, entering in with into the uh, G1 this year, I can see, I can definitely see it. Let him have an excursion out of Japan. Let him get a bit more flavor on himself. Have another match or two with Sonata. I say at least one more, maybe, just maybe he inks out a win in a G1 matchup with Sonata. Like I said, if it even still placements on there. Because I think that thing is pretty planned out ahead. And get them to run it back and have a decent linked main eventing match. Then I'm down for the cause. But that's just my humble opinion about it. But yeah, it's about damn time that Jack Perry did go heel. Now that, I'm going to go ahead and get that shit like an A+. Plus. And then him taunting the fans doing the wave. Fucking Taz's reaction to where he has to leave commentary. That's... 
that was was solid. That was great. It's about damn time we do something more and be done with Jungle Boy and just like Jack Perry shine. The the individual that Christian Cage really saw down there that can be world champion. Now then, for a match I absolutely loved. The BCC with Shooter Shota and uh, Kanosuke Takeshita going up against the Hung Bucks, Tomohiro Ishii and Eddie Kingston in a fucking... It was a bomb match. It was the first match I would say was match of the night and a possible match of the year contender due to just some dope-ass spots they did that I've never kind of seen before. And also just the multiple feuds that are going on there. Obviously, the BCC versus the Elite, uh, Kingston versus uh, Claudio, the relationship between Kingston and Moxley being in question. Um, we got the Elite and their problems with Kanosuke because he fucking turned on them. Like, it is just a fucking lot. And that's just the storylines. Let's go ahead and bring into the fact that everybody in this match performed great. Uh, Shooter basically being, you know, the the youngin' in the uh, whole squad next to uh, Wheeler Yuta. Basically putting on, getting his getting his rings in. Eddie Kingston being my hero of the fucking match. Not only selling story, but really just taking so much fucking punishment and abuse. And when I say fucking groundbreaking spots, I mean in the middle, two men chopping their asses off, showing their fighting spirit while all behind them is utter fucking chaos. I'm talking about Moxley and Kingston just chopping the living hell out of each other. While in the back, everybody's going crazy. The hung bucks are flying. It it was it was ridiculous until Claudio had to break up the I'ma give that that fighting spirit. That amazing just back and forth. I'ma give it to motherfucking uh, Kingston. Oh my god. Kanosuke Takeshita and Ishii, that is a one-on-one I think I want to see. And Ishii um Go at the end, getting the fucking dub, but that's jumping the gun because I also have to talk about more in the storyline where at one point Eddie saved Mox from a super kick party. But guess what? Later on, whenever Kingsley was about to get 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 that work, Mox wasn't there. In fact, Mox added to it. Like, bro, this was so fucking good. And this could have main have been a dynamite and on its own could have been a match of the year contender. I will have to say this one for me just I, 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 a plus a plus. I would say this. There's a little something lacking. I don't know what it is, but there was just a, just a smidge keeping it from being pure perfection, and it could just be card placement, and this is just the wrong night for this. Any other time, though, this would have been an easy S. Yes. Easy. But A-plus is nothing to scoff at either, because the real, the real, the real S is for later, but I would definitely put this on, a, on my match contender. Uh, this would be one of my match of the years, honestly. Top five. So far. But what also you need to recall is that we have the series of tag teams in this joint. And and don't forget, the Bucks go great. Claudio, Yuta, and Moxley work, to get, work great. Oh, my fucking God. I would definitely say, if you are trying to get a brush on one of the best matches to watch, this is one of them for the night. No questions asked. So, I'm going to go ahead and put a little pause in here. This doesn't have anything to do with... um. With the matches, but obviously this is something I kind of do feel like I want to drop in there because I heard this spoken on a on someone else's uh show, and honestly I feel like I agree. This was a long show, yes. Maybe in places we could have done more time management to cut certain certain matches a little bit of time and gave like a breather, especially after like those banger matches on the show because having to follow some of these are just nigh impossible. The open from the opener up before the Elite versus BBC was alright and probably could have put some of those matches up in there or broken them up 
uh, not broke them up. Probably could have injected like some segments, maybe build some shows, some show some stuff for the game, something like give us like a like a five ish minute breather, because it is a lot to go back and forth. But Jesus Christ, I still love AEW pay per views. No question, that's just give me a little breathing room here, guys, please. So now that that little tangent is over, this has to be. A moment of pride and sadness. One, because this is the AEW Women's Championship match. It should be a great night. And more than anything else, this match was meant for Mercedes Monet. I can agree with that. Dude, with, you know, her should have been the inaugural Women's Strong Champion. A, uh, uh, New Japan Strong Women's Champion. But I will say, seeing Willow's popularity grow, watching her in the ring, I love Willow. I have nothing more to say about Tony Stone that hasn't already been said. She's great. She's amazing. We appreciate her as champion, as Hill champion right now in her promos for this. I fuck with it. Heavy. This match was really like a showcase for Willow on a grand AEW stage. Yes, I am sad because this is something we've seen too many times. I cannot stand constant repeats and just in the last month and a half, how many times have we seen Willow going up against some ver- some iteration of combination of matchups with the outside, the outcast? Too many times. And I appreciated this match, but you knew what to expect. Shit went his, went his way. The girls got sent off. Thank goodness. They had a great match. Willow was loved by a crowd and fired up. We saw a glimpse of what could be if Willow were to win that belt. Now then, I would say let Willow shine on her own for a while. I will say this time and time again. Beef up this women's division. Get more bodies and get more matches. I don't care if we have to have five, although seven to ten minutes should be enough to get an extra match in every fucking week, Tony. And... I cannot give this more than just a solid B. Not for lack of trying. I want this to be more. But I knew Tony Stone wasn't losing the belt here. Willow wasn't getting it on this night. But the night that Willow does, because Willow's the only, like, big, pure babyface in the women's division who has a strong following. And that is just from lack of bodies. Tony, we really need that worked on. But for me, I still say it was a good effort to at least show that, you know, the women at AEW still have plenty to prove and have plenty to go in with their male contemporaries. Just keep that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, before you think that I'm just like really ragged all because I love AEW's own division. I love their roster. I don't have enough from it. That is simply it. Now, for this match. That followed the ladies. Undeniably. Unequivocally. Unquestionably. Match of the mother fucking night. Match of the year. Leading. Handedly. Kenny Omega versus Will Ospreay. Now, one thing I didn't touch on early when I was talking about the BCC and the Elite match was that the BCC came out to John Moxley's Death Rider theme, his New Japan theme, and something about the air of New Japan, that strong style, means you're in for something special. No, not every New Japan wrestler that participated on the night was giving that. But when you felt New Japan just permeating a match through its intro introductions, you knew what the fuck you were getting. Kenny Omega versus Will Ospreay. Kenny Omega coming out, not in his AEW theme, but the one winged angel theme. My God. You knew what you were getting, and the bit, and it, and it did its do. It got the wrestling, it got the bulk of the wrestling BS done. 
biggest, I'm, I gotta speak on this negative right now so I can knock it out. Biggest negative, Don Callis. Don Callis had no business here. Like, <clears throat> he could have escorted Will just fine, got booted out early, which he did, giving a good chunk of his match. No Don. Then Don came in. Don basically did for Will what Don did for Kenny when he first won the AEW championship at Winter is Coming. And Don Callis, A, did definitely help give Will give Will some heat, but it was really just Don, heat on Don Callis because half of this crowd was for Will. Granted, this was in Kenny's homeland, his fellow countrymen were cheering him on. Will Ospreay is undeniably just that guy. He's on Omega's level when he was the type top guy gen in New Japan. And this match was so fucking brutal. I'm talking about you got legit strong style. There were drops on heads that had me fucking wincing and scared. Every impact after they after they shook off the dust, after they both start after it got understood, like I don't fucking like you. You don't fucking like me. Let's just go ahead and do what the fuck we came here to do. It started banking the shit out of each other. Oh my god, my nipples are hard from that. This was brutal. This was bloody. This was the men at their best. Kenny Omega delivering monster, monster strikes, monster slams, hitting the fuck out of Osprey. Osprey basically trying to fucking decapitate Kenny wherever he can, slamming, banging his head in the table, calling back to when Kenny did it to him back in New Japan. And the first encounter, oh my fucking God, going down into Osprey getting Kenny bloody and licking the blood off and getting called a sick fuck. Kenny Omega banging and getting Osprey juiced up. Even after Callus came in and he was over there, the false finish off of the, the one wing angel one kick out. Osprey getting disrespectful with fucking the boom, the uh, boom, uh, what was it, boom, a knee? Uh, fucking Koto Abushi's knee. The multiple finishers required to take out Omega because the cleaner, New Japan cleaner, is a different animal than what we get in AEW. Oh my god. I am ready for match number three. Match of the night. This was a fucking S because if you don't even understand how far this shit goes back, this shit goes back to when Kenny first left and basically told Will, basically, handle, handle my light work after Kenny left for AEW. And Osprey feeling mad disrespected. This shit goes back years. This is exactly how Kenny does storytelling. Kenny does long, long-term storytelling. Granted, I don't know if it was ever meant to get to this point. I don't know how much of the emotions are legit between the both of them, or this is just like playing up a story. But right now, they are one for one with a rubber match here, and I know the perfect place to settle that rubber match. I don't even care about getting the Elite versus CM Punk at All In or All Out. All I want is Kenny Os Kenny Osprey 3 in London, in Will's backyard for this title. And I don't care who wins at that point. All I know is if they can top what they're doing here, there, this arguably, in my opinion, can match Kenny's rivalry with Okada. That is how fucking ridiculously great these matches have been. Oh my god. I, 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 this, can, this can be its own thing. This could be its own video just talking about this one fucking match. I, I have to get this done. Granted, I'm doing a podcast style um, recording, but still, I don't want to have to make it monstrous long. But God, God, S's, S's all the way around, S for you, S for you, top rating I can give a match in my own grading system, and this match, I should have known was no, no question about it, was going to be it, oh my god, this was fucking fantastic, okay, daddy had to cool down because that was a lot, a lot, and technically this match really did it, so we have the three-way between uh, Darby, Sting, and Tetsuya Naito going up against uh, the Suzuki Gods. And they had no chance. They had no chance following this. I'm going to be real. This match would have been better going on after um, the opener, after MJF and Tanahashi. That's where I feel this one would have been better served. 
and uh, it was okay. A lot of older bodies, a lot of veterans in this match. I didn't even see the youngest really get active like I figured they would, but I mean, it was cool. Some decent spots. Although, I don't know what we're doing about the grandpa strength that Sting has to where he's like taking ridiculous bumps and just popping back up. God, that's just crazy to think about. Also, the fact of Sting and Jericho having never faced off is ridiculous. I definitely would have loved like TNA Sting, like TNA Sting of few years really in there going on going at, going against Chris Jericho probably would have been a much better match back then and I would still watch the one on one just for the vibe of it but mm, this was just this was fine I mean, I'm, a, I'm I'll give it a B for me really just terrible placement bad luck of the draw going on against Omega and Osprey and the match itself was fine Maybe a lesser combination of bodies could have worked. I, I don't know. Um, I just, it's just, it's just, you're not following that. I'm sorry. I am sorry, but that's really where I feel this match really gets. It's great. It's just a B. It's fine. Nothing bad about it. It's just fine. And now to close out the night, the main event. The American Dragon. Brian Danielson debatably best wrestler of a generation in the world. The litmus test for greatness going up against Kazuchika Okada. New Japan's ace. The Rainmaker. One half of one of the greatest series of matches in pro wrestling, debatably. Meeting up in nothing breeds grandness than the way this match begins. It opens with Danielson coming out to his iconic entrance when he was untouchable. The best technical wrestler, if not best wrestler in the world. The final countdown, the crowd coming, the crowd coming live for it. Danielson coming down, look like he's about to be in tears. And the fact that apparently this just to use this song just this one time was a wrestler's contract. I'm sorry, Tony, but we're going to need to get this at least one more time if we're going to have Danielson at All Out or All In. All Out more than anything else. All In more than anything else. Just saying that is a setting word, Devin, but also Danielson did get injured in this match. Still doesn't take away from it. It was a great match, although it got the time, the ending. Ending is what did it because Danielson did suffer an injury. And I'm gonna be honest, if we're going if we're really preparing to wind down on Danielson's career where he's basically being more backstage, handling creative, really being the manager or you know, speaking portion for the BCC, well then he he did go out on a damn good match. Probably didn't end the way he would have preferred. The man has been through a lot, and he was already coming into this a bit banged up. Technically, we got what we expected from Danielson. Okada was Okada. But I think following just Omega, even if it was a match separated, was still too much. This crowd was burnt the fuck out. And we weren't going to get that same level of viciousness that we were going to get in the same semblance. But it was still a great match nonetheless. Okada tapping out to a brutal series of... Throwing together subs for the label lock, which Danielson, again, being injured, was having a hard time getting it together. And no, this was not um, kayfabe. This was legit. He mentioned it in the post-match presser. And I am hoping that he definitely heals well. He gets all the time he needs. Tony Khan is pretty good about that. He, or I would say 90% of the time, doesn't really press his guys to go that far in. Um... Being completely different from what we were getting with Omega and Osprey, something more subtle, more slowed, was fine. We still got some pretty good, strong hits from the two. Devastating drop kicks, hard hitting series of just back and forth Europeans. Um, Danielson doing his best, you know, towards that tail end. That throws it off, but I'm not going to shortchange this. I'm giving this an A. For closing, and all in all, the card 
thrown together. I know we missed out on the Cole and Filthy Tom Lawler, which I was actually excited to see Filthy Tom Lawler in an AEW ring. And him and uh, Cole probably could have done some magic together, but I'm not going to fault it. The, the show still was a great show. No match, I would say, was bad or really dragged the show along. We probably could have, eh, like I said, maybe switched out the order of certain matches would have been fine. And, kind, and if not for the fact that Okada is the biggest name in New Japan, going up against Brian Denson, one of the biggest names in pro wrestling still... Closing out is something legendary, but following up Osprey and Omega so close just couldn't really save, I feel, the bulk of the energy for the crowd. In my opinion, they were still live, yes, but they just weren't as live as before, and this match did not match that same energy, that vitriol, that viciousness. I know who Brian Danielson is. I know he's supposed to be the litmus test, but he's also not... Uh, young spring ticket and Okada. He's not. He's not old or he's not out of it. Dare I say? But when? But I didn't really get the same Okada that faced Kenny Omega. It could just be a difference of styles. They're both. Uh, they both could be devastating impact wise. Okada is a showman more than anything else. I am going to grant this one an A. I believe I said that, but in case I didn't, this one's going to get an A for me. And for the Knights, I am going to grade Forbidden Door twenty twenty three. A, I'm going to give it a A- minus to a solid A. I'm leaning a bit more on the A- minus side, but I can also give an A just on the three key matches. Um, like I said, there's nothing bad to speak on. Even the pre-show heated this crowd up perfect. Perfect. Um, the real negatives I'm going to state will just come down to the placement and reference I felt the IWGP World Heavyweight titles got. It didn't really get it didn't really get the same vibe and feel that I felt it should have. And I have plenty of prompt of both to say for uh MJF and Tanahashi, but you know, that's a world title. And I I guess going on first helps, but that style being a bit slower was fine, but comparing it to the to the zero hour, I can definitely, I will be able to admit that it lacked. All in all, though, watch the show. If you have not, give it a second watch if you really want. More than anything else, check out, I would say, the pre-show. Check out the BCC versus the Elite. Check out Osprey Omega and the 